All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. So, a few logistical items to start. Uh, hopefully, you're all aware of the fact that you have a problem set due at 11.55 Friday evening. You also have midterm next Tuesday in class. To the best of my knowledge, it's closed everything, so just come with yourself. Questions on, uh, we'll, we'll take questions on the problem sets here in a second. Any questions on the midterm? Uh, just in general, logistically? So you don't uh, like repeated notes or anything like last time? I, I, I don't think you can, I double check with Professor Hahn, but I don't think so. Is it going to be like short answer or? Uh, yes, I would expect it to look similar to your 2500 midterms. Um, I would expect it to look a lot like some of the questions you've gotten on the problem sets thus far. It'll be something you can finish in an hour in a class period, <laughs> or at least that's the right time. Yeah. Is there going to be any sort of like previous exams or So Professor Hahn said that he will be releasing a, uh, a, a sample exam either, by, hopefully by this time tomorrow uh, or, or by this evening. So in conjunction with that, I'm having two review sessions. You should have gotten an email about it earlier. If not, you should figure out why you're not getting emails from Moodle. But, um, Two review sessions on Friday, one at 1 o'clock and one at 2 o'clock. They're both in the C cell classroom, which is where we have the 2500 recitations, the computer lab there in the center of the C cell. Uh, so the goal is that he releases the practice midterm sometime in the next 24 hours so that you guys can all look at it and decide what questions you need to ask me to come to those review sessions. They're optional. Uh, I'll be doing them just answering any questions you guys have. So if you want to show up, come with questions. People show up without questions. I guess we can just awkwardly stare at each other for a bit. I don't know how much it'll help you on the midterm. That's what I'm sure. So any questions on any of that, any, any of the logistics of that? All right, so come to the review sessions on Friday. We can go over the practice midterm. We can go over any of the previous problem sets, or we can go over anything else you guys feel like. Uh, depending on what else you pick, I may or may not know what I'm talking about, but I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. So. All right, so as far as submitting the problem set goes, you either have to turn it in as a PDF on Moodle by 11.55 this Friday, or you have to turn it in to me at the two o'clock review session on Friday. That would be your last chance to turn it in in person. You can, of course, also turn it in to me at my office hours tomorrow or at the review session at one o'clock, but your last chance to turn in a physical copy will be that two o'clock review session on Friday. You can turn it in today. You can turn it in today if you'd like. I'm happy to take it off your hands. Any other questions? Okay. I have a question about the problem set. Okay, give me one sec. The, the one last logistical item that's coming down the pipe is this Friday we'll be releasing pro programming assignment three. You have two weeks to do it. It's due that Friday night right before spring break starts. Um, you will need to spend some time on it. it. It shouldn't take any more time than the previous one, but it's certainly going to take more time than the first one. It's structured a little bit differently. I, I would expect, we're gonna talk about it today after we get done with any questions, but I would expect the programming portion of it to be not all that difficult, uh, but it's an analysis project. So in addition to the programming part, you have to do some analysis and write a report, and that's probably where you're gonna be spending some of your time. It, it's due, I mean, so you have two weeks to do it. If we assume you don't start it till after the midterm, you essentially have a week and a half to do it. That should be plenty of time, but don't expect to start it the day before. You're gonna need to, start putting in some time on it each day right after the midterm to get it done in a comfortable amount of time. Okay? All right, so now we'll go ahead and take any questions on the problem set real quick, and once we're done with those, I'm gonna talk through the intro of this next programming assignment. Um, so if you have a, uh, like a preemptive priority scheduler that's scheduling processes based on priority, you have two processes that are on the same priority over each other then how do you determine uh, the precedence of which process should go before the other one? It's implementation specific. Okay. So for the sake of that question, I mean, just assume an implementation. Okay. Often you'll go with whichever one you got first, okay. just because that's easy to implement, right? Like that, that's the easy implementation. So it would be like the first come, first serve thing. Yeah, it tends to be, uh, it tends to be undefined behavior. I mean, unless it's a round robin priority scheduler, and then it's going to switch between those two. It's going to create keep switching between those two priorities. But um, it's implementation specific. The only guarantee is that a lower priority level will go for a higher one. There's no guarantees within a priority class. Any other questions? I actually have a question about the next uh, programming assignment. Um, are we going to have meetings? 
about that? Like, yes, they'll be after spring break. Okay. The good news is you're writing a nice report for this. You have to turn in Friday night. Everything will ask you in the session will pretty much be in your report. So if you just read your report again before the grading <laughs> session, I would expect you to be in pretty good shape to explain stuff to me. Um, it's not going to be, uh, because it's kind of report, the main deliverables, the report, I wouldn't be so concerned about forgetting about the code you wrote. Just reread the copy of your report for the your grading session. Make sure it's fine. What if we just read the report during the grading session? Well, you're not going to have time in all likelihood. <laughs> and I will have already read the report, so I'll just be bored. And I don't grade as well when I'm bored. <laughs> Eat more candy. Should we bring you toys? <laughs> All right, any, any other logistical questions before I kind of dive into the intro on this programming assignment? Okay, so um, one item to note is, like I said, we're going to release this programming assignment on Friday. Today is going to be the main time you're going to get me to explain it to you, because I'm at a conference next week, so the next presentation I'll be here for will be two days before it's due, which probably isn't the best time to start asking me questions about it. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions today. And more importantly, feel free to, I mean, once we release it on Friday, just to understand, hit me up via email uh, or come to my office hours next week. Um, those, will be your, those will be your best opportunities to ask me questions about it. It is a new programming assignment. I did just write it, so it may have mistakes. Let me know if you think there is one. Uh, most of them will probably just be stupid typos. but. Give me feedback. I'm happy to revise it for next year's version. Um, so ask me questions today. Juno will be running all of the programming, or we'll be running all the recitations next week. Uh, but I'm more familiar with the assignment than he is. So you're welcome to ask him questions. Uh, but you're also welcome to email me or come to my office hours next week if you're if it's not clear what you need to do from the write-up itself. All right. Uh, as usual, actually, the best place to ask questions isn't even emailing me directly. It's to post them on the group discussion board because then everyone gets to see my answers. Um, you can send them to me directly. I'll probably just redact your name and post my response on the group message board anyway. Uh, but that's that. All right? Okay, so high level overview of what your next assignment's going to be. Essentially, it's a benchmarking and analysis assignment where your goal is to benchmark the various schedule policies available within the Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel has one scheduler, but within that scheduler there are a number of different policies where the policies kind of dictate how tasks get scheduled. There is a round robin scheduler built in. There's a FICO scheduler, so this is the same as first come, first serve. And then there is the ubiquitous other schedule, where this is the schedule that actually gets used almost all of the time on a regular desktop system. These are especially real-time schedulers, and unless you write real-time embedded systems, you've probably never touched them before. This is the default scheduler for scheduling policy on Linux, where the current implementation of Linux sketch other corresponds to what's called the completely fair scheduler. Uh, which is a time-sharing scheduler, uh, the goal of which is to have good performance on a desktop system where you have a bunch of things running and you need user input, all of that. These are both, like we said, real-time schedulers. They are not necessary, and the reason we don't use them is because they're not well suited for, um, they're not well suited for, uh, for real-time uh, work on a computer where you are not well suited for, uh, not real-time, uh, for time-sharing work on a computer where you want to make sure you can use your mouse and everything like that. But these are all built-in scheduling policies. There's actually a few additional policies. There's one called sketch batch, and there's one called sketch idle. These are real-time policies. These are time-sharing policies. On your regular Ubuntu Linux system, this is pretty much the only one that ever gets used, except for a few rare exceptions. But the other ones do exist, and for the academic benefit, it's interesting to look at how they behave. So what you're going to be looking at this assignment is it's essentially a design and run a series of benchmarks that compare the performance of these three schedulers to each other, and then write a report commenting on why you're seeing the behavior characteristics of each, uh, of each scheduler that you are. So the next phase is, you have these two schedulers, we have to benchmark them. So the question then is, well, how do you benchmark a scheduler? 
And the general idea is you're going to have to write some programs that are characteristic of certain types of programs on a computer, right? You obviously can't run every program ever. That would be the best benchmark. But you can run a set of characteristic programs that kind of represent how most programs on the computer would run. So when we talk about characteristic programs, we normally, in terms of scheduling, we normally talk about a couple of properties. We have what we call CPU bound processes or programs, where a CPU bound process or program is a program that's runtime is primarily determined by the speed and power of the CPU. It's computationally intensive. How quickly the CPU can turn through it is the limiting factor in how quickly it will run. You okay with that? On the other extreme, you have what we call I.O. bound programs. So an I.O. bound program is not really computationally intensive at all, but it may rely on a ton of file access or a ton of file read writes, where the limiting factor in the execution time of an I.O. bound program is the amount of time it has to spend in the I.O. system. So this is often waiting for buffers to get flushed, waiting for files to become available, all of the dirty stuff that's involved with I.O. Then we have mixed programs that lie somewhere in between these two extremes, right? This is, they, they're fairly CPU intensive, but they still rely on IO requests often enough that that comes into play. So what you need to do is write one test program that kind of exemplifies each of these different classes. So you want to write one test program that's primarily CPU bound. This is going to be a computationally intensive program. Do something like calculate pi or, or implement a pseudorandom number generator. Uh, you're going to have an I.O. bound process. This is obviously going to mainly need to do I.O. without a lot of computational intensity. So this would be like reading and writing 10,000 bytes from a file over and over again or something like that. Uh, and then a mixed program is obviously you want to do something in between this, where maybe you have an iterative algorithm that each iterative step it writes the intermediate result out to a file or something like that, right? It's kind of open-ended. You can write three programs, you can write three programs that exemplify each class whatever you want. In your report, you're going to need to defend why your program is a good example of that class of programs. But what you actually write is up to you. So at this point, I mean, we're kind of taking you through the test matrix for this. But uh, we now have two vectors. We have the three different, we have one vector that represents what scheduler we're testing, where we have three different options. And we have one vector that represents the type of program that we're testing in that scheduler, which is three different options. So I mean, if you've done test matrices before, we're up to nine possible test combinations now, right? You have each of the three programs run under each of the three schedulers and the data that generates. There is a third parameter that you're going to be asked to test, and that is the scale. Um, so a scheduler just run on one program is meaningless, right? If you only are running one program at a time, all of these schedulers are going to do exactly the same thing. If you only have one program, there's nothing to schedule, there's no scheduling policy, they all just hand over the only program they have. It's when you have multiple programs that the different behaviors of the schedule start to become evident. So you're never going to want to test with just one program, but there is a question of how many programs you should test with. And these different schedulers will scale in different ways. So you're going to need to run a test that runs each of these programs. So you're going to need to run each of these simultaneous copies of each of these programs. You're going to have one test that runs a small number simultaneously where small is probably in like the five to 10 processes range. You're gonna to wanna to have one that kind of represents a medium load, where this would be tens of processes. And you probably want one that's gonna be a heavy load, where this would be hundreds of processes. Obviously, these numbers are going to be a little bit dependent upon the hardware you're running on. Uh, if you can see no difference between running 100 and running 5, you probably are going to need to increase this number. If you have a really beefy machine, this may turn into thousands, this may turn into hundreds. Uh, I mean, you may need to do a little bit of experimentation to get to the point where you actually start to see some differences. Um, or maybe you can't talk out your hardware, in which case you'll just have to talk about that in your report. You'll probably be able to. Um, there should be, at least between a few of these, some pretty evident differences regardless of your hardware. Um, so you essentially are now up to 27 test cases you have to run, right? 3 by 3 by 3. So under the real round robin scheduler, you want to run a CPU bound process with a small number of copies running simultaneously, with a medium number of copies running simultaneously, with a heavy number of copies running simultaneously. That's three, then obviously here to here, across three, here to here, across three. So it becomes a three by three by three test matrix, which gives you 27 possible combinations. 
we're kind of comfortable with the, the high level overview. So this is really, I mean, the assignment goes beyond this a little, I mean, the assignment write-up goes beyond this, but this is your assignment. It's using these 27 test cases, write me a convincing report that explains the different behaviors between these. It's really open-ended. You can kind of do that however you want. Now, what I'm going to talk about today and what the assignment goes into is a suggested method of doing it. You don't have to use that. If you have your own way you think you can do this, great, go for it. As long as you can get this representative data set and then explain it to me, I'm happy. Um, but we will go a little bit more into how this can actually be implemented uh, today. So any questions on the high view? So when you say like tens of processes, you're talking about tens of IO bound processes, you're yes. not the same program? Yeah, uh, absolutely yes, and that's a good point. Um, so to some extent, you're not gonna be able, you're gonna be running this on a computer that obviously has the regular processes running, right? You have the Ubuntu desktop manager running. I mean, there's some stuff you can't control. But for the most part, you're not gonna wanna be running, you're gonna wanna close all possible programs that you can when you run each of these tests so as to minimize outside interference. That's gonna be especially true when you're testing Sketch Other because this is the schedule that all of the regular system processes are also running under. So you're inevitably gonna to have to share with the rest of the system. There's no way around that. Um, what you definitely don't want to be doing is, yeah, you want to do all your CPU, when we say run hundreds of processes, we mean run 100 copies of the CPU bound test program. We don't mean run 25 of this, 25 of this, and 50 of this. You, will, you should never really find yourself running these simultaneously, because uh, that's just going inter to inter inter intermingle your results and you're not going to get good data. Um, so some intermingling is unavoidable. When you're running under Sketch Other, you don't have, I mean, there are some processes you just, that just have to be there, uh, and you're just going to have to live with that but you don't want to add to the load, right? You, you want to make sure that it's only CPU bound processes running at a time, it's only IO bound processes running at a time, it's only mixed processes running at a time. You could add an additional dimension to this that looked at all possible cross combinations of this, but then this gets up into the hundreds of test cases pretty quickly, so don't worry about it. Um, assume you're only doing, you do all your CPU bound testing, and then you do all your IO bound testing, and then you do all your mixed testing. There's no mixing of these different types simultaneously. All right? Could you do this with threads, or does that have to be processes? Um, you could do it with threads, but do it with processes, because uh, threads should be scheduled in pretty much the same manner, but uh, all of my test cases I've only been doing it with processes, and I'm not entirely sure whether, so the, the key part comes when you're switching which processor these are running under, I'm not sure how that affects the behavior of threads. I do know how it affects the behavior of processes. So I would skip with processes, fork is going to be your friend. Um, if you want to do with processes and threads, and then tell me if there's any difference, great. I don't know if there will be any difference, and I wouldn't just do it with threads until you know whether or not it actually makes any difference. Any other questions? All right. It really shouldn't be any harder to do with processes than it is to do with threads. It's just the semantics are a little bit different. Um, I'm going to leave the low races. Okay, so what we're going to do for a few minutes now is I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of the Linux scheduler. Where, I'm not going to dive too deep into it because you guys can always read the source code on your own time, but uh, hopefully give you enough of an overview that, I mean, the report's not just writing up your results, you have to provide some explanation as to why you think you got these results. And to do that, you're going to need at least a high level understanding of the behavior of the Linux scheduler. So, like all good things in the Linux kernel, the Linux scheduler is poorly documented and a moving target. So what I'm telling you today is true today, but that doesn't mean it'll be true tomorrow or next week or even next year. Pretty much everything I'm talking about uh, is post the 2.6.32 kernel, which I'm pretty sure happened in about 2008. Um, there was a big change in this kernel in the scheduling framework. So, if you have old Linux kernel books, or you looked at older versions of the Linux kernel, everything's changed, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. The current scheduler still looks pretty much like the scheduler they implemented here, with just a few minor changes. So everything's pretty much been the same since 2.6.32. Uh, all factors would indicate that it's going to be the same for the foreseeable future, but it's at the whim of the Linux kernel maintainers, so who actually knows what's going to happen. Um, but do know that if you have references that date back before this, which a lot of references do, their information is no longer accurate. 
So if you go searching for resources to use in your report, you can only use resources that are newer than this date, more or less. Anything older than this date, the information is not going to be applicable to the system you're actually benchmarking. All right. So the Linux kernel scheduler, uh, or the scheduling subsystem, is organized in a semi-modular manner where you have a core scheduler where the, the job of the core scheduler is basically to implement all of the non-policy parts of the scheduler, right? It's what just implements the raw behavior necessary to load a task onto a processor to figure out what task needs to be running next, or, or to ask what task needs to be running next, all of that jazz. Within, outside of the core scheduler then, you have what are called scheduling classes. Where currently on Linux, you have two scheduling classes. You have the real-time scheduling class, and you have the completely fair scheduler scheduling class. Where the policy implementation for how the scheduler actually behaves is dictated by each of these policy classes. If you look at the kernel source code, there's actually three files here. There's sketch.h, which kind of implements the core scheduler. There's sketch underscore real time, or there's sketch.c, which is the core scheduler. Sketch underscore, underscore rt.c, which is the real time scheduling class and sketch underscore cfs.c, which is the CFS scheduling class. Like we said, the default scheduling policy is part of the CFS scheduling class, so most of the time you're dealing with the code in here. Um, kind of in the other view here, so that's just the organizational structure of the core scheduler. Each of these scheduling classes implements one or more of those scheduling policies we looked at. So like we said, this implements sketch rr and Sketch uh, FIFO. And this one implements Sketch Default, or not Sketch Default, Sketch Other. Uh, just FYI, Sketch Other is also called Sketch Normal. They mean that they're, they're aliens to each other. Um, but sketch other is the old name, so I'm not sure we'll stick with. Uh, sketch batch and sketch idle. So these are where each of these policies get implemented. Now each process is assigned to a specific scheduler policy. So in user space, these are all you ever touch. This separation is just a source code separation. This is an implementation separation. Um, these actually go, I mean, these scheduling policies have existed in Linux going back a ways. It's this nice separation of them on this side that's actually newer. Uh, so from the user space, you all your only control is you can assign a policy to one of these different scheduling types. So kind of looking at it from the other end, on any computer you have a series of CPUs, right? Uh, or a CPU may have more, more than one core, so on and so forth. We're going to kind of gloss over the difference between multiple CPUs and multiple cores on the same CPU and just refer to them all as processors for the sake of this discussion. So your computer has one or more processors. Associated with each processor is what we call a run queue. It's a terrible name, uh, and we'll get into that. So ostensibly, in the olden days, the way this used to work was there would just be, it literally was a queue, right? There was only one, and it was for each, you only had one processor, so there really was only one. So you have one queue, it was associated with a single processor. That queue just held a list of processes where every time the CPU needed to do something new, it just grabbed the next process off the list, so on and so forth. Um, if it's round robin, it's a little more complicated. It's then every few seconds it grabs a new process on the list and moves the current one back to the top of the list, so on and so forth. That's not how it works at all anymore. Um, but we do still call it a run queue, even though it's not a queue anymore. So the way it works today, I mean, as you can see, this concept of a single run queue per processor, so I mean, I guess the first thing we need to say is Linux has one so-called run queue for every processor. That's an architectural decision. That's not true of all operating systems. Some operating systems will have a single run queue that then maps to all processors. Linux has a separate run queue per processor. So we essentially have everything I'm drawing over here has a mirror for every, every processor, okay? 
So we still call this a run queue, but as you can see, a single run queue isn't exactly well suited to this world where we have various scheduling policies, right? How do you reconcile what each of these are trying to do if you only have one queue keeping track of your processes? <coughs> and the answer is you can't. So we still call it the run queue struct, and if you look in the kernel code, it's always referred to as RQ. Um, we still call this a run queue struct, but it's not actually a queue anymore. It's not even close. In fact, what it has inside it now is a series of pointers where, at the very least, it has pointers to separate data structures for each scheduling class. So right now, there are two scheduling classes in the kernel. There's the real-time and CFS classes. This has, I mean, has a bunch of other stuff in it, too, but it has pointers to these two classes, um, where the real-time class then points to some data structure that the real-time scheduler uses to keep track of all of its processes, and the CFS class points to some data structure that the CFS class uses to keep track of all of its processes. Okay, so I'm just drawing this here, but know that it's mirrored over here. This is a per processor uh, situation. So even these are no longer queues at this point. So this is definitely not a queue. This is a collection of pointers to other data structures. Um, this, these aren't queues either. These are whatever the scheduling class wants them to be. So each of the scheduling classes needs some data structure to keep track of all the processes that it's currently trying to schedule. That's what these represent. For the real-time scheduler, this is actually a, this is a array of queues, is the way it works. It's an array of linked lists, is what the data structure actually turns into. Because the real-time scheduler has the process, has a concept of priorities. So you have a different slot in the array for each priority class, and then on each priority class, you have a linked list of all processes assigned to that class. And then to schedule the next task, the, it goes in, grabs the highest priority task that actually has something on its list and returns the first item from that list, right? That's kind of how it works. The CFS, this is actually a red-black tree, uh, which is what it gets used most of the time. So you've had data structures, hopefully you're a little bit familiar with red-black trees. You're not really going to need to know too much about it for the sake of this, but red-black tree is a self-sorting tree where the key kind of is, it can always just grab the leftmost node, and that's the next process that needs to run uh, in, in the way the red-black tree is keyed on how much time the process has previously had. So it uses red-black tree to try to give all processes a fair amount of time. All right? So we call these run queues. We call this the real-time run queue. We call this the CFS run queue. None of them are queues. Don't get too hung up on that fact. They're all other things at this point. But the way this actually works is there are a series of small time ticks where each time tick, that just signals the core scheduler that needs to do something. And what the core scheduler does is there's actually a hierarchical relationship between any scheduling classes in the core. So this is higher priority and this is lower priority. So what the core scheduler does is it hits a time tick. It says, OK, for my first processor, I need to figure out what the next task I need to run is. So it actually will call into each of these scheduling classes in order of priority. And it calls a function called tick next where each of these classes, I mean, these are hooks, and each of these classes has an implementation of its version of pick next task. So the core scheduler hits a tick, it turns to the real-time class and calls the pick next task function. It passes to the real-time class a copy of the run queue for the processor it's currently scheduling. This function inside the real-time class then grabs that run queue, it uses its pointer inside of it to access the data structure it actually cares about, it performs some processing on that data structure to figure out what it thinks should be run next, and then it passes back a pointer to the task struct, or so essentially a pointer to the process that needs to be run next. The core scheduler then grabs that process that it hands it, loads it into the CPU, and keeps running until the next tick. If the process that gets passed back is the process that it's currently running, then the core scheduler doesn't do anything and it waits until the next tick. So that just it keeps the current process loaded in. People kind of okay with that? If the core scheduler calls into the real-time class and this pick next task gets called and there are no processes that are running under either of these policies, then the real-time class just passes back a null. The core then goes to the next class in the list, being the CFS class, calls its version of pick next task, and it does the same thing. Most of the time, this just returns null, because very rarely do you have any processes actually running under these classes. For the sake of your benchmarks, they'll obviously be different, but on a regular Linux system, it's almost always skipping right through this, 
calling directly into the CFS function, which is then calling something from the sketch out there, which pulls off this red flag tree, and that's what's been scheduled. scheduled. All right? OK. So there's a lot more magic than this. That That's kind of what we're going to go into here. The document explains a little bit more, and then there's plenty of resources out there. In particular, if you want to read about the cleverness in the current scheduler is the details of how this red black tree works. Um, I'm not going to dive into that. You probably won't need to dive too deep into that for your explanations. But if you want to, there's some information on out there uh, about how this actually works. Also, you all have a copy of the Linux source code on your VMs. If you really want to know how it works, read the source code. Uh, or so says Linus. <laughs> so, uh, the only other thing I'm going to say about this structure is there's a hierarchical relationship, but the hierarchical relationship only matters between the implementation classes. Within each implementation class, the, pro the hierarchy of priorities is, I mean, is undefined. It's up to how that class implements it. So, we know that any real-time processes, so anything with these two policies, are going to take precedence over any of these policies. But we can't say that a sketch FIFO process is going to take precedence over a sketch round robin process or vice versa. Okay? Cool. Um, people feel a little bit okay about this point of on? So, in lecture, he was talking about multi level queues. Um, and there's like Q1, Q2, Q3, all the way through 140. So, the core queue is what picks which queue next. Like is run next, or which processes in the queue is run next? So what he talked about in class is outdated. Um, that's no longer true. Okay. There are, uh, first of all, the only place you see multi-queues, like that 140 number, is in the real-time scheduler. That's how it's still implemented. It has one per priority level. Um, it's not 140 anymore, it's 100 now. Uh, that got changed when they changed this. But that concept, the concept he kind of explained is how the real-time queue works. The CFS queue doesn't do that at all. In fact, there are no pri so priorities are completely ignored in the new system. There are no priorities for standard processes. It's the whole point of the CFS scheduler is that it doesn't need priorities um, to operate. It operates priority lists. So you still pass the priorities. It just throws them away right away. So the concept of task priorities is an outdated concept that only still matters in the real time thing. It doesn't matter in the current implementation. Um, these are the only, I mean, we talk about a run queue, but these are the only queues that exist in the system, are, are the ones that are part of these structs here. There is no master queue, right? All that, I mean, to figure out what to run next on here, it's essentially the pass comes out of one of these queues and gets placed directly on the processor, where this arrow represents that pick next task function in there. So you don't need a master queue. What you have is you have these local queues every tick you ask the appropriate class what you should be running next on each processor. The appropriate class uses on the back end its own data structure, whatever it wants to use. And from that data structure, it determines what needs to be run next. It hands that to the core scheduler. The core scheduler is completely agnostic. Uh, other than it, it knows that it has to pass through one of these structures, but it's completely agnostic to how these are implemented. So in the run queue, the real time. So what do you mean by the run queue? You mean the struct? Here? Yeah, yeah. The, okay. The run queue. <laughs> um, so the real time is a is a pointer to a linked list, and the linked lists are really each node in the linked list. Well, it's is a, a pointer a to an array. It's a pointer to an array of an array from zero to one hundred, where each index in the array represents a priority level. Each each element in the array is then a pointer to a linked list that is a linked list oh. of tasks a linked list of processes that are assigned to that priority level. So including the run queue, it's like a fourth dimen four dimensional. Yeah, I mean like this has point well really is even fit because this is actually a struct there's they're like there's some there's some metadata that needs to be embedded in here, so this is actually a struct and then one of the items in this struct points to the actual that actual array struct. So it's many dimensional. Okay. The core scheduler doesn't care. All this core scheduler knows is it's gonna high hand you this high level this high level struct and it's gonna expect back from you a task struct, where a task struct is essentially a one task struct per process. The task struct holds all of the, that's how a process is represented in the operating system. It holds all the information the process, the operating system needs to know about that process, meaning it, the location of the program counter, whether it's swapped in or out, location of stack pointers, all of that. So the core scheduler calls the pick next task function, 
in each of the classes. It hands it this high-level struct. The class takes the high-level struct, dances to wherever it thinks it needs to dance to, uses some magic to manipulate that data structure and produce what task struct it wants to run next, and hands that text task struct back to the core processor. The core processor then looks into that struct, picks out the program counter, loads it in, picks out the other appropriate counters, loads them in the appropriate registers, and continues execution with whatever it just got loaded. I have a simple question that's not as implementation specific. Um, in the case of a process that has been on the, if, so, if the process has been swapped out to this, it's not even in the right queue at that point, right? Right, so these queues only hold processes that are in the runnable state. Yeah. Um, there are additional data structures that we're kind of not really worrying about here that hold non-runnable tasks. Uh, but yeah, you, so if so something is- periodically get loaded into the- Right, I mean, so, there, 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 so there's a lot more, this is not the only task inside. There's a series yeah. of hooks inside here, including an add task and a real, like a queue, uh -huh. an in queue and a DQ task. Uh -huh. And those get called every time a process gets moved in or out of the runnable state. Yes. And those are in charge of actually adding the process to one of these data structures or removing it if it's no longer runnable. There's other parts of the system that are in charge of keeping track of non-runnable processes. Okay. Um, then when they get the signal that they've been moved to a runnable state, it signals the scheduler, which calls the appropriate in queue, so on and so forth. All right. You were talking about ticks. Can you explain that a little more? Like this? So that's just, I mean, you need, you need, uh, yeah. so they're called ticks. Don't confuse them with time slices in a round robin scheduler. Ticks are way finer grain. You essentially just need some way of coordinating how frequently this core scheduler tries to see if you need a new process, right? And that's what the tick represents. The tick is just a quick iteration. That, that's basically the speed at which the master loop in this core scheduler spins that then goes through, and that's how quickly it asks whether or not it should switch processes. So ticks are very fine resolution. Uh, if you, like I said, if you get past back the process that's already loaded in, the scheduler doesn't do anything, but it does have to at least check that. Uh, and then if you do design it, preempts the current process by unloading it, so on and so forth. And they're consistent in length, the ticks? Uh, ideally, yes. Um, they're not actually, because this is a login lookup. It's a red log. I mean, some of these operations are not guaranteed to be constant time. So a tick, obviously, a tick could exceed the max length. Um, but uh, ideally, yeah, they're constant time. The constant time, they're quick. You can also call the core scheduler anytime if a processor reaches an idle state, meaning whatever it was running on it finishes, then it just it, it doesn't even wait for the next tick, it just calls the core scheduler. Or if whatever's on it has to get swapped out because it's waiting on something, then it just calls the core scheduler. So the tick is the default mains, but there are other ways of kind of calling this core scheduler routine. People okay? I'll write it right. So that's all I'm gonna say about the implementation. That's kind of the high level view. That should give you enough to dive in deeper where you think you need to. The handout I'll be having out has kind of the list of all the good references uh, for this kind of stuff. You can find them all online if you want to read about it. So what we're gonna look at now is, we're gonna look at a little bit of code that kind of demonstrates how you might want to do this. Um, I don't want to erase. So when, when I drew this, all this stuff at the beginning of class, we kind of talked about the different test parameters, right? You have the three schedulers, you have the three different program types, and you have the three different scaling classes, right? So that's all fine and dandy. That kind of tells you how you could write a whole bunch of uh, test cases, but it doesn't really tell you how to instrument them. So just being able to run all of those 27 test cases is, is great, but unless you can instrument it, you're not actually going to get any data back from them. So Again, it's a little bit open-ended. There's a huge number of ways you can instrument stuff in Linux from design trace toolkits and things like ptrace, which is kind of like the really complex way of doing it. If you want to do that, great. Um, to the very simple side of things, which is just calling the GNU time command for the most part. So we're going to look at an implementation a little bit that uses the GNU time command today. Um, essentially, you have to ask yourself the question is, what metrics actually matter? what metrics regarding to how a program ran are actually going to tell you interesting things about what the scheduler was doing behind it. And in general, the things we care about are what we call the real time. So this is the wall clock time from the instant you started the program to the instant it finishes. We care about something called the system time where the system time is the amount of time your processor spends or your process spends running code in the kernel, essentially. 
Uh, so code that has to swap in and out, code that has to context switch, code that has to file many system calls you call, that all takes up system time. We have what's called user time. So this is the amount of time you spend in the code you actually wrote. So this is non-system time. And then we have what's called the wait time. Where the wait time is, um, is essentially the amount of time you spend just waiting on things. If you go to open a file, you go to write to a file, and you have to wait for a buffer, you have to wait for it to hand you back the file handle, that's wait time. This is when you're sleeping. So this is sleeping, as far as program states go, you're sleeping when you're waiting, this is running, this is running, real time is some combination thereof. Where the relationship between these is the real time is equal to the sum of the other three. So that's equal to sys plus user plus wait. All right. So those are the four times we deal with, and they all kind of tell you something unique. Um, in a compute bound process, you're going to have wait times going to pretty much go to zero, right? Because you know, wait times largely associated with I/O. Uh, that's where you have to wait on things. So a compute bound process, your wait times almost always going to be zero. Your system use times going to be the bulk of it. A real-time process in a batch system is going to be pretty much all user time. Because if it's not context switching or it's not using a lot of memory, there really aren't any calls it has to make into the kernel. So it pretty much becomes 100% user time. If you have a round-robin system or a time-sharing system that's doing a lot of context switching, obviously the more you have to context switch, the more your system time is going to increase. Because every time you go to context switch, you have to spend some time in the kernel doing all of that work. An I.O. bound process, on the other hand, wait time tends to dominate. So the amount of time you're sleeping becomes the bulk. Uh, your system user time can even become insignificant compared to that. The other thing we care about is, uh, I mean, there's no other things we care about, but the number of context switches is a handy metric to have when we're talking about schedulers, because what does a scheduler do? Well, it forces context switches or not. Um, so we would expect to see some relationship between the system time and the number of context switches. If we have more context switches, you would expect for it to take more system time since each of these requires some amount of time, right? So, people okay with these metrics? There are some other metrics you can gather. Uh, these are kind of the core five that, that give you the basic fingerprints of how different schedulers are going to look, right? If you monitor these five things, you'll get a pretty good idea of what the difference is between the different schedulers is. So how do you get these five things? Well, there's a number of ways to do it. The easiest way to do it is to call the GNU time command, where the GNU time command can return to you all of these things except the wait time. But fortunately, you don't need the wait time because there's a dependent relationship here. If you have the real time and the user time, the wait time is the real time minus these two. Right? So you can calculate the wait time. Um, it'll also give you the number of context switches. So, the new time is just a program you run from the command line. You then pass it as an argument, whatever program you want to run. So this is great uh, as long as you're OK with getting the average results over your entire program. So when you write, we talked about those three program classes. So let's look at like the CPU bound one. So you're going to go and write some CPU bound program. But like we said, you're going to need a way of running multiple copies of it simultaneously. And the easiest way to do that is to probably structure your program such that it internally forks off a bunch of children processes where the work are actually, where all of the work that is the CPU bound work is actually done in the children processes. The parent process just hangs around, spawns all the processes, and then hangs around to reap them as they finish. Um, you need to be extra careful about reaping processes here, like we talked about in 2400. If you zombify any of your processes, you're totally going to screw up your statistics because time only pulls down the statistics for processes that are improperly reaped. So if you don't leave any processes, you're going to throw them out of this. When you do your average, you're going to be divided by too big a number. It's going to give you artificially small results. Um, so the way I would structure all of your programs is basically, I would say, the best thing to do is to pass as an argument to your programs, maybe amongst other things, is the number of copies you want. So you pass a number of copies. It has some kind of a master loop that just spawns off the children. The children copies then go and run. The parent copy then sticks around and just keeps track of all the children like the ideas of all the children in an array or something, and then just loops on the sleep command through that array, waiting on each one, so that eventually, once they all finish, it completes that loop. Life's good. So I'm not going to go a ton into the forking behavior and everything. We touched that in 2400. And the shell lab, this will be a little bit simpler, because you don't have to worry about all the signal handling we have to worry about. You pretty much just have to worry about forking and waiting appropriately. Um, but that's how I would structure your program. So there's other ways of doing it. 
you could, instead you could write a master program that basically forks and execs a whole bunch of just basic programs. Um, that has some difficulties, uh, the least of which is the behavior of which scheduling class you have set is somewhat ill-defined across an exec call. It's well-defined across a fork call. If you set a certain scheduler in your parent, every time you fork, it inherits the scheduler. If you fork an exec, uh, for the real-time schedulers, it's, it inherits it. For the CFS schedulers, it's implementation specific. Um, I think Linux inherits it too, but you'd be better off avoiding this X if you can, because it avoids the ambiguity altogether. Uh, so that would be just fork inside each of these processes individually. That saves you the time to deal with these X and all of that. Uh, you may also find yourself wanting to write a top level script that calls this with all the different process numbers, right? And then basically grabs all your data, wraps it up. I mean, if you're a scripting genius, great. It'll make your life easier because you can automatically suck out all your data and put it in nice tables and that jazz. But the high level script would just be to make your life easier. It's not a requirement. Matter of fact, none of this is a requirement. As long as you can get the data that you need, you can do it however you want. Uh, this is just how I would do it. So, moving along here, you have the new time command. It gives you this data. Um, we're going to look at a, I'm going to show you guys an example real quick of the CPU bound process and kind of calling the GNU time command on it to look at what it can do. My process doesn't fork or anything, it just runs one copy. So obviously you'll have to add the complexity of figuring out how to run multiple copies of it. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you and to the document. So the program I have calculates pi. It uses the probabilistic algorithm to calculate pi. Are people familiar with how you calculate pi given a series of random numbers? In the circle. Yeah. Um, it's actually a beautiful algorithm. It's my favorite. So essentially the way it works is you imagine a circle inscribed in a square. You use a random number generator to generate a series of random points. On, the, um, on this grid where you have like a zero, zero in the center. You then can tell, so the probability of, you can tell whether or not any given point lands in the center by taking its distance from the center of the circle, right? You can just use the distance formula. We know that the radius of the circle is r. When you calculate the distance from zero, zero to any of these other points, if the distance is greater than the radius that lies outside the circle, if it's less than the radius that lies within the circle. You then, you, you bound your random numbers so they're guaranteed to always land somewhere within the square. So the probability of landing within the square is one. They're always gonna be in the square. But the probability of landing within the circle is the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square, assuming your random number generator is uniformly distributed across both axes, which the Linux random number generator is a uniform distribution. Um, so given that, we, can, we, we know that the probability of landing in the circle is equal to the area of the circle divided by the area of the square, we can calculate the probability of landing in the circle just by running 10,000 trials, where we keep track of how many of them were in the circle, how many times the distance was less than the radius, and how many times the distance wasn't less than the radius, meaning they're outside of the circle. You divide those two numbers by each other, you're gonna get yourself a probability that's always less than one, right? You can then back into pi from here because we know the calculation for the area of a circle is pi r squared, we know the calculation for the area of the square is two times the side, or the side squared, right? Where the length of the side is equal to 2r in this case. So the area of the square becomes 2r squared. Um, the r squared's canceled out, the two turns into a four, and this basically means that the probability of landing in the circle should be pi over four, right? Where we can then calculate pi by just multiplying whatever we calculate for this by four and we get to pi. So uh, we're running out of time, but I'll do this all this code later. I will show it to you real quick now. So I'm not actually going to take you guys through my code. I'll release it later. Um, it does what I just said it does. Um, but what we will do is we're going to look at how we can use the time command to gather some information about that. So I have this pi command and I have this pi schedule command. Where the pi command just doesn't deal with the scheduler at all. It just runs normally, meaning it's going to run under that sketch other. Uh, this command takes an additional argument, which is essentially what scheduler you want it to use. So let's just run the normal one real quick. And I want to run it through well if we just run it by itself. We do pi, we ask for, so you pass it an argument as to how many random points you want it to pick. Obviously, the higher the number, the closer pi we're going to get. 100 doesn't give us a very good estimate. 
If we go up a few, we start to get closer. Yeah, we go up to a million. So at a million, you kind of, well, even at 100,000, you've locked in the first two digits of pi, right? It is fighting for the rest of them. Um, so on and so forth. We can run this through the time command. So you have to be a little bit careful. If you use the bash shell, it has a built-in time command. It doesn't actually give you all of the nice data that the GNU time command will. So I have to actually call the GNU time command by, I can't just type in time. I have to type in its full path. If you try using this dash v flag, which is what gets it to print out all the information, and it tells you that it doesn't know dash v, it means you're calling the bash version of time. You, uh, you have to call the real version of time to actually get access to all that additional information. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. It's going to cook for a few seconds. And then it's going to spit out this nice big. So it gives me, I, I ran it uh, 10 million times. So I ran it on 10 million points. It gives me its what, what it actually outputs. And then it gives me all of the data that the time command outputs. Where the things I really care about are, like we said, the user time, system time, and wall clock time. So this is our real time. As we can see, it's clearly a compute bound process. It spends 3.05 seconds running its regular code in the processor and 3.06 seconds total. So the wait time is less than a hundredth of a second or in the order of a hundredth of a second, right? Um, it doesn't really spend any time in system time. If I turned this up by a couple of zeros and made it run for a couple of minutes, you would start to see the system time get to something that it can keep track of. Uh, the other thing we can see is the number of involuntary context switches here. So this is the number of times the scheduler just forced it to stop running because it wanted to run something else. If we look at the alternate version of time now, or the alternate version of pi now, so this one I can actually select which scheduler I want to run. So it takes an additional argument of the name of the scheduler. So we're going to run it once with the same scheduler we just, we just ran it with. So we'd expect to see about the same results this time because this is the default scheduler. I'm specifying what it should have already done, but we can confirm that. Uh, it gives me a little bit of an extra printout telling me what. Gives me a little bit of an extra printout telling me what the different scheduling policies that it's dealing with is. Uh, zero is the other policy, so it's telling me it started out at zero, it switched to zero, and if we look, everything's about the same. Our run time is pretty much identical. Number of contexts is just about identical. If, however, I go to run it under one of those real-time ones, so let's try the round-robin scheduler. In order to run one of the real-time schedulers on Linux, you have to be a privileged user. So I have to add a sudo in front of this, or it's going to kick back I can't use the real-time scheduler. Note that these real-time schedulers take precedence over all the regular schedulers. So this is only taking three seconds, but if I were running this for three minutes, like you probably are, or for a large order of time, like you'll probably want to for your case, I'm not going to be able to do anything on my computer for the next three minutes. These are not time-sharing schedulers. Once I launch a task with these, it's going to go off and do that at the expense of my mouse movement and everything else, right? It's going to appear as though my system is frozen. If the system's not frozen, you just got to let it cook until it's done. But these are not, the, the, the real-time schedules have, a, there's a time and a place. Um, you have to understand what they do. So if we go ahead and launch this off, So if we look now, we'll see the number of involuntary contexts which has went way down because we're no longer part of the time sharing scheduler with the rest of the system. Instead, it's much more conservative. It's only going to switch amongst the, I mean, really, it's the only real time process running right now. I'm not entirely sure why it's 23, other than there are a few things in the kernel that you just can't avoid switching in and out. So that's why I that guys that up. The percent of CPU time dropped by half. Right, and if in, so the amount of time it's spent, uh, right. So it must be scheduling it against something else. Um, with just one process, it's hard to tell. If you put this up to 10 processes, you probably expect this number to go up to like 90%, right? I think the operating system is what it gets balanced against. So when it's this in the operating system, it's going to get half the time the operating system. Gonna get half. If you have 10 of these, they're going to get 90% so on. We can look at the same thing with the batch. So if we run sketch batch, it spits out its same thing. The batch one has almost no context switches because it's not even round robin. And we're back up to using a lot more of the CPU time because it's just going to run it straight through pretty much. So I'll release this code later. There's basically just a single function you call to switch to those different schedulers. And that's the only difference between the original version and this version. This will come out on Friday. If you have any questions, be sure to email me or hit up the group list or come to my office hours next week. Thanks a lot, guys.